welcome to episode 82 of the Swamp Flicks podcast. My name is Brandon Lede. I'm Brittany Lombas. And we are recording in Brittany's apartment in Pigeon Town, New Orleans. Pigeon Town, no pigeons though. Still waiting for them to show up. <laughs> and this is the podcast version of the movie review website Swamp Flicks. Yes. I saw you the other day. We went to a divine themed drag show. Yes. Like blocks away from yeah. my work downtown. Not, yeah, it was really good. It was fun. It was kind of weird. Like, that was a really well-lit venue, and the show was <laughs> punctual, and everyone was relatively sober, and we were all there to... And I really liked that. Yeah. <laughs> I was glad that I got to go home kind of early. Like, I was expecting to stay out until midnight, which is so hard for me to do these days. So that was really nice. I was expecting to be out till, like, 2 in the morning, to be honest. <laughs> and you were ready for it, probably. Oh, yeah, I was. <laughs> I, like, yeah, I had a big cup of coffee before I went out, and I was, like, pumped and I don't think it's a bad thing, but it was definitely odd to, like, go to one of the cleaner, more um, put-together drag shows I've been to in a while. And it was in service of Divine, who is, like, a hot mess and, like... I thought that made it funnier to me. I thought yeah. it was, like, a joke in itself. <laughs> it was kind of surreal. <laughs> because I was, like, telling, like, a co-worker, I'm like, oh, I saw, like, a drag queen put dollar bills in a blender with vodka and she blended it and drank it. And they were like, where were you? And I'm like, the Ace Hotel. <laughs> like, one of the, like, bougiest places. <laughs> I gotta say, that was some of the most amazing shit. so funny. Yeah, that (laughs) performer's name was Mary Boy, and their first act, you know, they did an eat your makeup act where they literally Mm -hmm. just sat there and ate their makeup in front of all of us, and it was, that was gross enough, but putting dollar bills and what looked like oil in a blender and then drinking the contents was so so gross. I loved it. Yeah, it was amazing. It was like, I feel like she embodied, like, a lot of that like grossness of divine spirit yeah. which was really cool and put in tain uh did a beat poem that was insane about meatball subs <laughs> in honor of a uh, female trouble that was amazing <laughs> ccv Dementh, who has been a guest on the show and is in part of crew divine yes. with us she's basically our drag mother yeah she fucking killed it her dance moves were spot on very accurate she's like if she was meant to do anything in her life it has to be this yeah like it's insane and I don't know, all the performers were good, and yeah. the show was, like, over on time. It was a fun evening. It was a fun show, and we even had, like, a, a taffy. Like, it's someone dressed like taffy. That proves something I've been thinking about Crew Divine, though. That you could put on the Divine makeup and then be any character, and someone will, like, get what you're doing, right. you know? Right, right. I was picturing, like, taffy being one of those things where you could just put on a baby doll dress. As long as you have the really stark eyebrow makeup on... Right. You'll look like you belong in the crew, and you'll still be able to do other characters that aren't Divine herself. Maybe we can do that next year. I kind of thought about branching out to Cuddles. Ooh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Enchante! <laughs> uh, what about the, like, riding crop outfit? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, I already have, like, the figure for it, so fuck. <laughs> Might as well put it to use. <laughs> Just don't knock out your teeth for the uh, act. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Well, what have you been watching movie-wise lately, not drag show-wise? Movie-wise, I watched this film. I was kind of browsing on Canopy, and I came across this movie. Never heard of it. Fucking loved it. Probably one of the best movies I've ever seen. And it is called That Cold Day in the Park. I've never heard of that. Really want to make us watch this for, like, movie of the month. Okay. Well, it's a 1969 kind of indie thriller starring Sandy Dennis. Um, she was in, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Oh, she's like the younger one. Yes. Yeah. So in this film, she plays this, she's probably late thirties, early forties, but she keeps the company of like really elderly people. And I thought that this movie took place like somewhere in England because when it starts off, like there's this gorgeous apartment and there's this dinner party and Everyone there is, like, over the age of 70. <laughs> and they're like, well, pass the Cornish hens. And I'm like, oh, okay, so, you know, this is going to be, like, a British movie or something. And then as we get further along in the film and people who aren't in that circle start talking, they're all English. <laughs> like, like not English. American. American English. Yeah. Um, and I actually uh, looked it up and it took place in, like, Vancouver. Oh, weird. <laughs> but the reason is that there it was so heavily British influenced is because this woman is very lonely, very to herself. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, both her parents like passed away and she just hangs out with their friends, which are like, you know, 70, 80 year old people. And she like goes and watches them play like they called it bowling, <laughs> but it was like done in like a golf course. 
Candlestick bowling? That might be it. That's how she occupies her time and like baking Cornish hens for these people. This sounds very British. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, during her dinner party with her friends, she looks out of her window. So she's very wealthy. She has this really nice apartment with a beautiful view of a park. And then she looks out her window while it's raining during this dinner party. And there's a, a young man sitting on the park bench in the rain and she feels sorry for him. So she kind of, when everyone leaves, she walks out and she offers to give him, you know, a place to dry off and a warm meal. And he goes into her house and he doesn't talk. He like listens and comprehends everything, but he doesn't like respond to her. So you think he's mute for the most part. And she kind of like, in a motherly way, like undresses him to like wash his clothes and he takes a bath and then he just kind of prances around her house like butt naked wrapped in a towel. So he doesn't talk and she just keeps talking and talking and talking and filling the silence between the two of them. And it's obvious she's like really lonely. So she's not really like she doesn't have any social skills like she's not really connecting with this little guy. And <laughs> um, then just a night with like a hot bath and a warm meal turns into her like fixing up the guest room for him breakfast lunch going out to the store to buy him a bunch of new clothes and then this little fucker escapes from the window of that guest room at night and goes to his real house (laughs) where he fucking talks oh weird (laughs) well we end up finding out that he shares like this apartment with his sister and it's kind of like not super nice like it's not horrible but it's not as fancy as this like lady's little guest room so he crawls back into the window and like that's like his thing like he leaves at night crawls back into the window to like live in like luxury and um she finds out he's leaving and then she nails the window shut and becomes like prisoner yeah and it's like she um (laughs) <laughs> becomes like obsessed with him and then like this like weird sexual tension builds up between both of them where like she seems to be very sexually interested in him and it kind of like slowly gets to this point where like there's nothing sexy happens i mean he's just naked in a top like a blanket for the most part that's as like sexual as i think it gets between the two of them and it's just uncomfortably like whew, like oh like i thought you were like a mama to him And then more incestuous shit happens where, like, (laughs) his sister finds out where he is and she, like, goes to visit him. And then she starts trying to seduce him in this lady's house. So that gets kind of funky. But, yeah, um, then some crazy shit happens. Like, (laughs) and I don't want to spoil it, but there's, like, this intense buildup till the end. And the ending, what happens in the end was very unexpected to me. And then, like, the film just stops. And there's really no, like... What's the word I'm thinking of? Like, you, you don't really feel at peace. There's and no it denu- abruptly ends. There's no denouement. It just ends in yes. its, like, uh, climax. Yes. And just a little tidbit about this that I thought was really cool. A lot of the scene transitions were, like, zooming in on, like, candles lit or something like that until it got very, very blurry and then zooming back out to when it's clear. Oh, that's cool. So that was, like, really neat. And it almost felt like voyeuristic a little bit sounds romantic honestly yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, it was so good in a weird way yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> not romantic as romantic as you can be with your prisoner <laughs> with your prisoner boy yeah how, how what's the age difference he looks like he'd be between 16 and 18 mm. and she's like late 30s early 40s at the yeah. oldest she probably looks older than she she looks older than she really is i think just because of like you know she's like proper and you know, hanging out with very elderly people. We were just talking about psycho biddies before we started recording, and yeah. that sounds like an, a role an older person would take. Like, yeah. I know, we, like Greta from earlier this year or something like that. She like, would win the prize for the best young psycho biddy. <laughs> the youngest I think. psycho biddy. The youngest psycho biddy. <laughs> um, yeah, I fucking love this movie. I love like watching people just like descend into madness, and that's oh, what yeah. she does. So great. And there's a lot of scenes where it's like you're watching her do shit from like a window. Like she's in the doctor's office and you're watching her in the waiting room from like the window. So it's, <laughs> ooh, it's just, ooh, it's creepy. So I went from watching this like mildly kind of sexy show or show, huh, movie, 
to a super raunchy um, film that I didn't expect to be as raunchy as it was. But um, I watched uh, Roman Polanski's Bitter Moon. Never seen that. From 1992. (laughs) (laughs) It was so creepy to me because, I mean, Roman Polanski's a pedophile. Yep. And the main couple in this film, like, the guy's like 40 when he meets this girl who looks like she's 16. And she becomes obsessed with him and then he, like, abuses her. So I'm like, God, this is probably just him. (laughs) Which is almost the exact age difference of what you just described in the earlier film. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But it is way creepier. Both creepy. But we know that the man behind it is a creep. (laughs) Right. In real life. So, right. Well, you know, people... I've like heard people talk about this film or like read reviews and stuff like oh it's Polanski's greatest thing he's ever done it's his oh it's his masterpiece and I'm like he's just being a perv Um, I kind of like that though I like it when pervy Polanski not him in particular but I really like it when a movie is just somebody letting out their like id like when it's just somebody like letting out their like worst side oh this shit yeah you would shit (laughs) Like, with this shit like a, in this movie. I don't know if I would love to hang out with Ken Russell because he's like an abusive mean drunk. He's dead, so it doesn't really matter. But but I love watching what the mean drunk right. things he does on the screen, you know? You're right. I'm not defending this Roman Plansky. <laughs> no, I, okay. I haven't seen it. But... It wasn't horrible. Like, yeah. it wasn't horrible. It was just kind of like filthy and it was in an icky way because of roman polanski was well, there anything to it besides the fact that he's like sexually interested in her or so it's crazy the beginning is on a cruise ship hugh grant and his wife they're a couple on this cruise ship and they meet this man in a wheelchair who's like a paraplegic and he has a really really hot wife and she's like sexy dancing all the time on the cruise ship and stuff well Hugh Grant's character goes to hang out with him in his cabin, the paraplegic guy. And he's like, let me tell you a story about how I met my hot wife. Oh, I I see you looking at my wife. You think she's hot? Do you want my wife? And it's just like weird. Like He's trying to like sell his wife to him. We go from being on this cruise ship to going to Paris like years ago when they first met paraplegic and his wife. And that's where he was like, he's a trust fund baby in his like 40s who's trying to be an author. So he's, you know, moved to Paris and then he meets her. And then it kind of goes back and forth to him telling Hugh Grant about how they're, the story behind their relationship. And so it'll go for like, you know, 20, 30 minutes and then boom, we're back on the cruise ship. Hugh Grant goes hang out with his wife and then he goes back for another part of the story. Mm. It gets like super sexual where like the relationship between the paraplegic gentleman, his name is Oscar and his French wife, same as Mimi, so he starts to tell like, Hugh Grant how they both had this like very like erotic relationship where they were doing S and M, and then you know we see him like dressed up as a pig, where like Mimi is like you know spanking him in their Parisian apartment, and then he like <laughs> he tells like Hugh Grant like this crazy story where he's like she was drunk one night just in a t shirt, and then she started peeing on the TV. And then I ran and let her pee all over me. And like, and Hugh Grant's like, oh my God, like what's happening? But he's slightly into it. Oh yeah, So course. it's like stories like that where you're like, what the fuck? What the fuck? So he's just kind of giving him these really intimate details. And then what happens is he gets tired of her and she's obsessed with him. Probably because she was like a teenager when they started getting together. So he's like, you know, we can't do this anymore. And she runs back to the apartment. like, I can't live without you. I'm going to kill myself. Oh, no. So he takes her back and he's like, I took her back and I figured, let me just make her as miserable as possible. So he just fucking insulted her like consistently like, oh, like you're ugly. You're gaining weight. You have acne. Your hair looks like shit. You look stupid. You like a clown. You're not cleaning the house good enough. You can't cook. You can't do anything right. Like treating her like that. It gets to the point where they're on a plane where she has like an abortion because she got pregnant for him. And then he was like. I can't be a dad. I'm like 40 and I'm trying to be a writer. What's wrong with you? So she has this abortion and he feels bad for her because I think she had complications and he's like, let's go on a trip. Well, they get on a plane and then he leaves the plane before it takes off. So she comes back and like gets revenge on him. Kind of like he tears her down and then she tears him down and then they fucking marry each other and they just fucking hate each other. It reminded me a lot of that film that we had from Movie of the Month, the French film, 
Oh, Love Me If You Dare? Love Me If You Dare. It was kind of like that. Like, that was way cuter than this. Um, but the same, like, we hate each other so much that we love each other. It's almost like emotional S&M instead of sexual S&M. That's a good point. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what this is. <laughs> so, yeah, it was okay. It was a fun watch. Like, I think it had, like, enough, like, mystery in it to, like, keep me interested. But other than that cold day in the park and Bitter Moon, I haven't really watched anything, like, notable. What about you, Brandon? Well, I have a couple things that um, I think you in particular might be interested in. Yes. Uh, so our current movie of the month is this film, Belazare the Cajun, that you picked up. <laughs> yeah. And I've been kind of going through looking for other Cajun movies. Like, yeah. what is in the Cajun canon? <laughs> uh, not Bobby Bear, but like the, the canon God. of films. And there's really not a lot. From what I understand, a lot of like Cajun representation on screen is... You know, kind of the local yokel backwoods characters and thrillers and stuff where, like, the protagonists right. will go to, like, a gas station in the middle of the swamp. And they all talk like a bear. Yeah, exactly. Which is not what Cajuns talk like. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's like some rural archetype from elsewhere in the country. Right, but I think it's so here. funny. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, or, like, uh, <laughs> I was thinking of... um, That was alligator people. Yeah, I was totally thinking of that. <laughs> with uh, Lon Chaney Jr. is just like, I hate gators. I ain't never going to stop killing gators. <laughs> this kid's drunk and shoots at the swamp all yeah. day. So Belazare the Cajun's a little different because it's like somebody from Cutoff making a movie about Cajun. So it's like obviously a lot more like forgiving and like right. loving and empathetic. A lot of passion in it. It wasn't the first movie to do that. It was just the first movie for like a Cajun director to do that. Mm-hmm. There's this film from 1948 called Louisiana Story. Oh, you might be interested in it, but it is a fucking evil film. Ah! <laughs> so it's pretending to do what Belazare that does, where it's like, look at these people and look at the way they live and um, let's all celebrate and look at how beautiful that is. And it's also pretending to be a documentary, kind of. This is yeah. from 48, and it's from the guy who made Nanook of the North, which is like one of the first featured like documentaries, supposedly. Almost sounds like my dog's name. Oh, uh, yeah, it is. Pretty close. <laughs> A nook of the north well this yours. guy lies like his okay. documentaries are not real oh they're, my god they're more docudramas they're like based on real life but he like fudges the facts to make the pictures more entertaining mm-hmm. and what's really fucked up about louisiana story is that it's a lie that is specifically made to benefit oil companies oh uh, gross so it's this really beautiful slice of life movie about this cajun boy who travels through the swamp on his p-rog with a um raccoon leashed to the front of it he has like a pet raccoon that goes on these adventures with him and he doesn't get rabies <laughs> yeah he doesn't no he's like oh, wow. what cuddling. a miracle he's like cuddling with this raccoon <laughs> and like snuggling with each other Aww. uh and the raccoon's not scratching his eyes out um you know they go through gator infested waters and like yeah. the movie like kind of prods gators into eating birds for the camera and stuff too which is kind of fucked up but it's this really beautiful mostly silent art film from 1948 but it's also secretly funded by standard oil yeah uh, and it's a pr film that's supposed to make everyone feel better about oil drilling so as this kid's navigating through these wetlands and you're looking at wetlands that like have disappeared since the movie you know was filmed the movie's also telling you it's good for oil to drill where you live even though they're, like, largely responsible for those wetlands disappearing in the first place. And basically this boy's father signs away part of their property for this oil company to come in and drill. The boy has some concerns about whether or not it's safe. He's a little scared of it. And by the end you find out, oh, it is safe and it's good for the community because it puts food on the table. And he gets a shiny new rifle uh, at the end because his family's got money now. So, like, legit what everyone in the body thinks now. That's so fucked (laughs) up. Where I'm like... I mean, I've been through the fucking BP spill with my family, which was hell. And then just, I don't know, just the, <laughs> how shitty the environment is. And I'm like, you know, we're so polluted and everything. And they're like, yeah, drill, baby, drill. What's so crazy about this one, too, is there is an oil spill in the middle of the film. <laughs> and it just gets resolved. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll just put the cap right back on it. And, and that's fine. <laughs> Oh my, and this is 1940? 48. Jeez And it's, it's specifically funded by Standard Oil. So it's a pretty major oil company. And at the end of the film, the oil company um, just sort of like packs up and leaves and put one of those little Christmas tree caps on the uh, <laughs> well and it's over with. And the family just has money and Easy oil's peasy. out of their hair. Yeah. It's fucking vile in that way. <laughs> but it's also, I don't know, this early Cajun story that you see on screen and really beautiful Do you know where it was filmed at? Like the location? Petite Aunt's Bayou. 
I do not know where that is. <laughs> A-N-S-E? A-N-S-E. <laughs> it's like small ass something. <laughs> tiny ass by <bayou. laughs> The tiny ass by That's probably what it is. <laughs> oh, that's around Avery Island. Okay. Yeah. That's like the Lafayette area. Cool. It's really cool for that too because like the um, footage of the wetlands and like the footage of the people, like all the cast are locally cast. Yeah. Even though it's a documentary, it's bullshit. Like, they're not actually related. They're not actually a family being documented. <laughs> they're but they, fake family. They are locals. They're just, like, sort of mix, mix-matched, you know? <laughs> it's so um, weird. Yeah, it is odd. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it is odd that anyone ever bought that bullshit. Like, especially the fact that you're watching this kid, you know, navigate these swamps with this pet raccoon on these, like, Davy Crockett-type adventures. Like, you would think people would see through that as being fake, but... Um, apparently, people bought the PR aspect of it. Interesting. Yeah. So, I don't know. It'll anger up your blood a little bit, but it's definitely interesting that looking. interesting. And it, it kind of gave me more perspective on, like, what Belazare, what made it different was the fact that it was, like, Cajun people making a movie about themselves and not, like, this oil company An oil coming company. In. <laughs> <laughs> no, exploiting them. Glenn Pete is actually Chevron. <laughs> <laughs> so, besides Cajun stuff, I know you also are interested in cats, and I have a good cat movie for you as well. Yes. This movie's called Lily Cat. It's from 1987. In the mid-80s, there were a bunch of alien knockoffs. Um, actually, probably since Aliens. So like, most of the 80s, there were a bunch of alien knockoffs. So you have these, like, confined space horror films set on spaceships where no one can leave. And, like, there's an alien on board picking people off one by one. This movie's interesting in that paradigm for a couple reasons. First of all, it's an 80s anime. So it's Japanese oh, cool. animation traditional hand-drawn 2d animation so it looks really good Mm -hmm. um it's also centers around three different cats that are on board this alien spaceship so in in the original alien ripley has that like orange tabby cat that she's like survives the uh alien attack with um in this film you know one of the women brings this cat on board they go into like hibernated sleep when they're doing like deep space travel and the cat gets let out of the hibernated sleep before the rest of the crew and what happens is there's now two imposter cats on board (gasps) no one of them (laughs) is this like machine cat that answers to corporate back home and is like snitching on the crew and like uh letting corporate control the ship through this cat and that is not actually a cat it's a -A c-a-t which is like a computerized animal techno robot or something but it's in the image of a cat it looks exactly like her cat so there's is it a siamese cat i don't think so they're so mean <laughs> <laughs> i have one that's yeah. why i know <laughs> all right it seems he would be the right evil. he's so evil he'd be the evil robot and the other cat uh in this equation is this shape-shifting alien that comes on board and takes the form of the cat and what it does is it infects people's lungs with this cat space cat bacteria <laughs> so just allergies exactly <laughs> And uh, when they start coughing, (laughs) they burst from the inside out and become part of that cat's body. Fuck yeah. So that cat gradually transforms. That's how I want to go. Into this like giant blob, almost Ah. like uh, the shunt. Like it's got all these different faces in it. It's (laughs) all twisting. Yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. And it gets really gruesome. It's like this R rated 2D animation film. It's really fun. Beautiful. Yeah. And I've seen more than a few alien ripoffs in my day. Mm -hmm. Like. Even at the beginning of um, that Tracy Lord movie we just watched, uh, <laughs> Not of This Earth, right? Yes. In the opening credits, they show like a bunch of them just by Roger Corman just alone. like a scam. Yeah. The beginning scam. <laughs> so that's like a highlight reel of a bunch of alien okay. ripoffs, and they all kind of look the same. This one has something different about it. It's like animated, and there's these three imposter cats uh, on board. Ugh, that's like everything I enjoy. And I think it's like 67 minutes. Really? Yeah. It's a really quick watch. Wow. Okay. The only like... I think cat anime that I can recall that I really liked was The Cat Returns. Oh, uh, yeah. Was that um, a Ghibli film? Yeah. That was, like, more of, like, magical cats that, like, walk around, like, people at night. Do they have tuxedos? Yeah. Like, okay, I kind of remember that. Yeah. One's a prince. This um, one's a lot more gruesome. <laughs> awesome. It's got, like, a Cronenberg kind of vibe to it. Oh, my God. Cronenberg kitties. Here I come. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And there's a pretty decent scan of it on YouTube as well. Really? Yeah. That's where Good. I have been watching it. Maybe I'll go to bed with that on. Well, today uh, we're talking about something that has nothing to do with anything we've talked about so far. No, not (laughs) even a cat. Nope, no cats. (laughs) Which there should be. Yeah, there should be like a horde of them. We're watching a bunch of gay plays that got turned into movies. That's the (laughs) general theme of the episode. Yep. 
Don't expect any cats, but, you know, some, like, drunken quips aplenty. Yes. <laughs> and all that's coming up to you right, right now. now. You know, Dr. Eve, I think next time I'm going to masturbate and I'm going to fantasize about a woman that's a little bit more masculine. Earl, that is not the point. Well, I'm sorry. I'm not quite sure what the point he is. And now it's time for our movie of the minute. This is where hosts of the show bounce back and forth recommending films to each other. What did we watch this episode, Brittany? We watched Sorted Lives. Which I had seen in high school, but remembered nothing about other than the cast. Like, I remembered Beth Grant being in it. I remembered Leslie <laughs> Jordan in his, like, drag. I just remembered the song. Ain't it a bitch? Bitch! Sorting out <laughs> our sorted lives. Sung by... Olivia Newton John. A bunch. <laughs> trying to launch a country career, it seemed like. Sold me. Yeah. 100%. Well, this is a movie from 2000. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a play written by Del Shores, and honestly, I was a little worried about it when we first started watching it, because the digital cinematography from 2000 has not aged well at all. It's like a soap opera. <laughs> like a really bad soap a opera. A really bad one, yeah. <laughs> I think probably I had watched this on VHS at the time, oh, which wow. I think is a little more forgiving than like the HD TVs <laughs> of now, you know? Right. Now there's no excuse. Yeah, it just looks bad. <laughs> but... The movie totally gets away with it because it is hilarious. It's so fucking funny. The writing is so sharp. <laughs> so what happens in this movie? So the matriarch of a family dies. I'm going to say she's like probably in her 70s. Um, her name's Peggy. And she dies by, well, not by, but she's having an affair in like a motel. With Bo Bridges. With Bo Bridges, a.k.a. GW. <laughs> Who is her neighbor's husband. So she's having an affair with a married man in like a seedy motel room. And she trips over his wooden legs. And she dies. And her family is preparing for her funeral. Which is sort of becoming this like family reunion. It's so hard to keep up with the family tree. There's so many fucking characters in this movie. So (laughs) Peggy's sister, Sissy... Played by Beth Grant is like her younger sister. So she's sort of like a sister to Peggy's children. Like they're really close with her and she's amazing. So she's like her big thing is like she's trying to quit smoking, but she's so stressed out that she can't. Um, And she keeps this little rubber band on her wrist and she pops it every time she wants a cigarette. And the movie does a good job of keeping this like large red welt around her like... (laughs) I don't know if she's actually doing that no. to herself, but it looks like But when you put legit. a rubber band around your wrist, it gets kind of like, I yeah. don't know. So, it's probably real. I don't know if it was a makeup job or if she was actually giving herself welts, but it looked really painful. I feel like Beth Grant would give herself welts. Yeah. So, there's Sissy. And then there are Peggy's three children. So, there's Brother Boy, who, his story, he's like the funniest character, but his story is so depressing. He is like a Tammy Wynette impersonator and his parents put him in like a mental institution um, because, well, he's a Tammy Wynette impersonator who's also homosexual. So they put him in like an institution for 23 years to like de-homosexualize him. So Brother Boy is the brother played played by by Leslie Leslie Jordan, who's amazing. And his birthday was recent, a few days ago. He put this like really like weird video on Facebook about it where he's like, today is my birthday today do you think people know who he is because yeah. i recognize him just from being around like he's a shorter guy he, does, he did a couple he's like a comedy show here not that long ago okay um and he played in ugly betty for like a little bit like he plays in like he's like little like roles Didn't he have something to do with creating will and grace too i'm not sure i'm not sure either i shouldn't have said that <laughs> <laughs> i will give him credit for it he's yeah, great whatever he's great he deserves leslie it. jordan the creator of will and grace <laughs> they should be sending him royalties either way <laughs> yes <laughs> give that man some money <laughs> All right, so there's Brother Boy, and then there is Latrell, who is, like, all about appearances. And she's kind of, she's the older sister, and she's kind of, like, trying to keep everything together for this funeral. So she's embarrassed as shit of, like, how her mom died. (laughs) Yeah, she is religious to, like, a self-deprecating degree. Like, she can't even stand to be in the room when you talk about sex. Gay stuff freaks her out so much. And she has a gay son (laughs) who, um, like, cannot come out to her. His name's Ty, and he, like, lives in Los Angeles or, like, Hollywood or something, where he's, like, he's, like, a soap opera actor, and the film kind of flashes to him every now and then, like, with his therapist, and he's like, I need to go home for this funeral, but I can't do it. 
And I like that it cuts back and forth from real therapy, which he's in, to the gay conversion therapy that Brother Boy is in. Where there's a woman who's, like, trying to, like... Sexually assault him? <laughs> yes! Into being straight? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Eve. With terrifying tits. Yes! <laughs> something really scary about her boobs. <laughs> She's just, like, her boobs go with her personality. Agreed. She's perfect yeah. for this role. And then there is... Lavanda. So Lavanda is kind of like the young, wild and out sister who seems like the funnest one, in my opinion. It's the kind of same thing on Golden Girls. That's the redhead and she likes to fuck. She's the Funny Blanche. you mention that yeah. because in the Sorted Lives television series, Peggy, the mother, is played by Rue McClanahan. Oh, well, there you go. Who is Blanche, the there Golden Girls. Go. So just like her mother. <laughs> Wait, so that the TV series is a prequel show? Yeah. Amazing. I did not know that. <laughs> Yes, it Which is. is amazing, too, because everyone in this movie, I don't know if they started in the play in 96, like five years before this was filmed, but they all seem a little too old for their roles. Yeah. Like, there's just something slightly off about it. They're, like, slightly aged out of the roles they're supposed to be playing. <laughs> right. That's why it's so confusing. I'm like, wait, who's whose mom? Like, how like... is Beth Grant, like, an older aunt aunt character to these two to sisters? <laughs> The... Latrell looks so old, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. Because <laughs> she looks a little younger later on. Yeah, yeah. But basically, uh, they're, they're preparing for the funeral. Like, this whole movie takes place in, like, a day. About a day, right? It feels like a short amount of time, yeah. Right. It's set across, like, several locations, and little groups of characters are talking separately. Yeah. Uh, and they all come together for the funeral at the end. Like, right. Like, all within this town. So there's, like, GW, who has, like, killed... <laughs> You know, quote, killed this woman. Yeah, he woman. feels guilty that his wooden <laughs> legs tripped this and killed this poor woman. Right. So he's, like, at Bubba's bar drinking, trying to get over it. And then there's all the sisters, like, trying to get shit together. And then there's, like, brother boy at this, like, what is, is that, like, an, an a, not an asylum, It's huh? a sanitarium, yeah. So, it should be illegal wherever it's he's at. It's terrifying. <laughs> he's being held prisoner for being gay. For 23 years. Yeah. So, yeah, and so all this is happening, and in between scenes, Olivia Newton-John shows up with her guitar and gives us a little, like, a little country tune. And that's her sole purpose in this movie. Like, she, her character is, like, bits and may, but her purpose is just to show up and, like, play music. Okay, <laughs> so this movie, like, and this play, even, <laughs> were written for, like, southern gay audiences, and I think... Olivia yeah. Newton-John coming out to sing country songs, like, in With gay Texas. With a rose tattoo on her tit. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, like, specifically, like, audience-pleasing. Oh, like, totally. To kind of, like, rouse you back. I mean, it the, worked for me. Yeah, it was fun. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think the movie's been largely forgotten, too, except in that it's, like, a cult movie among gay people in the South. Right. And as straight-laced and, like, King of the Hillish as all of these, like, Texas characters are, they're all basically saying these really bitchy gay retorts, like, the right. entire film. <laughs> And there's all these, like, fun little, like, I don't know, like, this shit that made me laugh in here was, like, Ty, the gay son, is, like, talking to his therapist about how he used to wear husky pants. <laughs> and his mom would, like, buy slim uh, jeans from the Goodwill and, like, put the slim sticker on the husky pants. Yeah, it's, like, a really weird... <laughs> it's, like, weird, funny stuff like that. Specificity to that. Yeah. You know, Beth Grant with the rubber band, like, training herself not to... Or the uh, mink stole that they... <laughs> that this Peggy is getting buried with a mink stole, and Latrell's like, it's not winter time. This is so embarrassing. <laughs> so she, like, goes to the church and, like, goes in her coffin, and they're... Her and, I think, Sissy are, like, lifting her up to get this mink stole before everybody sees her <laughs> in winter clothes in her coffin. But really, she's just stealing the mink stole for herself. Totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Delta Burke weeping and eating fried chicken. I forgot about Delta Burke. Yeah. So, <laughs> ah, Noletta. I am probably one of the biggest Delta Burke fans. Like, I have her fucking, like, her tank tops. I got her underwear. She has her own clothing line. And I love all her fucking movies. She's a <laughs> lifetime queen. Also, one of the best characters in Designing Women, which I was a huge fan of. Yeah. Still, I'm a huge fan of. So Delta Burke, like, losing her shit, eating fried chicken. Sobbing while eating fried crying. chicken. With her mascara running. It's such a weird image. So her character in here, Noletta, she's LaVonda's best friend. And they, like, <laughs> I get... feel like I'm at the hairdressers right now. <laughs> yes! <laughs> this is so still Magnolia's oh, that yeah, we're totally. at Miss Trudy's salon. 
Well, so they get super wasted and then they get inspired by Thelma and Louise and they go down to Bubba's bar and then they hold up the bar and they make like all the men kind of like dress in half drag. <laughs> yeah. And then like dance with each other and like look into each other and like take pictures and stuff like that. And they go to jail <laughs> and then they have to get bailed out before the funeral happens. <laughs> Okay, so that stuff's really broad and big, but, like, yeah, yeah. the smaller details are, like, so specific. <laughs> like, even Brother Boy's, like, drag characters, like, he was inspired by Jethreen from uh, the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> and, like, his characters that he likes to do are, like, Tammy Wynette and Loretta Lynn and Kitty Wells. These are very specific pop culture references right. that would hit, like, a Texas gay audience. I love that. Like, if I like, like, modern drag a lot, but I kind of, like, miss the the classic drag with like pageant drag pageant drag which this is he's very pageant drag which that's what i grew up with like this city had pageant drag for a long time we need a tammy wynette in town i'm sure there's still pockets of it you think so but yeah what basically what happened was visantos moved here from san francisco and started that drag school that everybody goes to Mm. um and it's been crazy great like there's so many great shows around the city and they're all cheap and fun but uh, I went to San Francisco recently for the first time. I've never been to yes. California before. And we went to this old bar called Aunt Charlie's in the Tenderloin. And we were watching these queens do this, like, show that they obviously have been doing the same show for, like, 20 years or something. Oh, cool. And it felt like a flashback to, like, I don't know, what drag used to be like here. Just the caked on makeup and, like, <laughs> the same tired, like, share medley they haven't updated since Life After Love. And, like, <laughs> I don't know. I definitely got that vibe from Brother Boy. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Poor brother boy. I think out of everyone, though, except for maybe Noletta, because of, you know, Delta Burke love, he's so funny. He's my second favorite character. Who's your first favorite? Beth Grant. Oh, totally. Who's basically doing her sparkle motion character from Donnie Darko, but like (laughs) at full length and given like an (laughs) army of like gay quips to like throw out in the meantime. There There is this great part where she's at her sister's coffin before the funeral starts and she's smoking in her face and we see beth grant through the eyes of like the dead sister and there's just clouds of smoke and she's like you know just like waving it away yeah waffing it away waving it away and i don't know i thought that was so funny (laughs) i love like one of my favorite things is watching like old women smoke i love that like i mean i smoke every now and then when i like get really drunk at a bar or something i'll have a cigarette but i don't do it regularly at all but I'm waiting until, like, I start to get, like, you know, my first good set of wrinkles. <laughs> and then I'm just going to hit those Virginia slams. <laughs> oh, yeah. She does smoke the longest, skinniest cigarettes <laughs> yes. I've ever seen. No, those are, like, Southern women, Virginia yeah. slams. Yes. Like, yeah. that, it's to a T. I thought it was so funny. Even just the cigarette she gets. But there's also, like, this spectrum, like, from her... Maybe she's, like, sort of towards the middle of it. But, like, let's say from Brother Boy to... The extremely Christian one. That's like the full spectrum of characters in this movie. Yeah. They're all different shades of Jerry Blank. Like every <laughs> character in this film just feels like Jerry Blank. It's like watching Death at a Funeral, which is like this like comedy of manners set at a funeral, but every character is strange to candy. Guess we'll never know. Yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> uh, my favorite quip is uh the uh trashy sister curses, and then the Christian sister says, You eat with that mouth? And she goes, Mostly. <laughs> It's pretty good. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So good. This is such a good movie. Yeah, it's really funny. And yeah, if you like King of the Hill but wish it was gayer, uh, I'd recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorted Lives, the gay King of the Hill. Yeah. And if you start watching it and you look at the tired 80s cast and you look at the digital cinematography and you're like, I'm going to bail. I can't watch something like this. Give it. A minute for the jokes to start. Oh, yeah. it is so funny and so tightly written. You could tell it was a play that was performed, like, over and over again. Even though it was a little over long for a comedy. It's like an hour and 46 minutes. I think the beginning of it would lose people because it's a bunch of old men at a bar talking. Yeah. Once you make it past that, you're in Sissy's, like, trailer. Yeah. If you spend five minutes with Sissy, you're good. <laughs> yeah, Sissy will pull you in. <laughs> and she'll, then... <laughs> she'll give you a Valium and some fried chicken. You'll be right on right oh his room. Oh, my God. <laughs> love her so much also one of the beginning scenes is when latrell's talking about like ty and how she's like i went out to see one of his stage plays and he's like butt naked in it oh that's one of my favorite um lines as well uh she's like 
He calls it art. I call it trash, which is so funny because you're watching a woman in a gay play called gay plays trash, but she does it in a way that you know is like a campy joke for the audience. It's so funny whenever yeah. they they have they're flashing back to the scene where she's in the theater. And he kind of like looks like a naked angel. And then you zoom in on her face in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's great. It's so good. And there's a lot of full frontal male nudity in that scene. <laughs> yes. It's very gratuitous. I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like there's nudity in this movie. I forgot about that. It's so, a little raunchier than you expect. Yeah, especially the um the therapist. Like she just like full on throws her brassiere off. <laughs> Poor brother boy. Yeah, he does not deserve this. Grandmother? Did they let you out of the home? Crystal, sign up Angie Dickinson here. Don't pay any attention to Cassie. She's bipolar. I think you're kind of precious. I'm not Angie Dickinson. I am Tammy Wynette. More like Tammy Why Not. So, what movie did you pair with Sorted Lives? So, what pairs very well with um, Sorted Lives is a very sorted wedding. <laughs> From 2017, which yes. is 17 years later than the original. 17 years later than the original, but in movie, like within the realm of Sorted Lives, it's 15 years after the funeral. I was a little skeptical of this at first because they switched out some characters because some characters weren't on board for this and it was crowdfunded. It's so disappointing. Like, but it's a, still good. There was a TV show in between these two movies. Yeah. And all the actors transferred over. But Olivia, they didn't want to do the movie. Olivia Newton-John, Beth Grant, everybody. Here, you get Delta Burke swapped out for the aunt from <laughs> Sabrina, uh, Sabrina <laughs> the Teenage Witch, the 90s one. Yeah. Beth Grant swapped out for this character actor who I recognize from Claws, and I kind of like her, but it's not Beth Grant. But she does a good job, I think, as, like, if there's no Beth Grant, like, she was probably the next best thing. She's like the the wolf mama on True Blood. Oh, okay. I've seen her in a few things. Yeah. You would like Claws a lot if you haven't seen that. I haven't. I don't know. Bo Bridges, they got some guy who looks nothing like Bo Bridges, <laughs> and his character just completely changes for all you Bridges heads out there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what would a Bo Bridges fan be called? Like a bridge? The bridge burners. <laughs> bridge burners. <laughs> so yeah, there's a pretty big leap even if you're a fan of the original movie. To have so many cast changes. Like, Leslie Jordan's one of the only, like, main people to keep. Him and uh, Juanita, who we never even mentioned, who's, like, (laughs) the uh, barfly who just gets wasted drunk and has no idea what's going on. (laughs) (laughs) Forgot about Juanita. I love Juanita. So, what did you think of Sorted Wedding? Like, what's what works and what doesn't work? It's so charming. I liked it. So, it's 15 years after the funeral of Peggy. And at this point, there's a memorial for her that's happening at Bubba's. And on the same night, there's this huge anti-equality rally that's at the (laughs) church. So it's sort of like a, how can I put it? Like times change. I feel like every year, like something changes as far as like gay rights go and equality goes. And so much has happened in those 15 years where like, you know, Ty He's, like, more accepting of himself. He's more open and about, like, whenever he visits town with his, like, black gay husband. You know, like, he was more, like, in the closet before and really, really afraid to come out. Where now he's, I don't know, more at peace with it, I guess. Or comfortable with it or being open with it. And this is set around the time that gay marriage is made legal. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Like, so, yeah, because that was 20... I think 2016. 2016. Which I think it's kind of odd. It seems like the movie was supposed to come out. Like, it seems like they started making it before it was They legal. started um, funding it in 2014 and they started filming in 2015. You can feel that. Like, it feels like it was a movie that was pushing for gay marriage to be legalized. You think this is why gay marriage became legal? No. <laughs> <laughs> very started wedding for the I win. I think they had, they had to fix things after the fact. I uh, think it's a very after started it was wedding. Legalized. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> Um, All those years of activism (laughs) did not matter. We just needed a cheap Beth Grant. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So that's like the big story or the plot with this is everyone. There's these two big events happening in one night. And um, what really worked for me was Brother Boy's story in here. 
He's the best part of this so movie. So Brother Boy is has developed a new act. So not only is he Tammy Wynette, he is the We Three Queens of Apriar. And he is Tammy Wynette, Loretta Lynn, and Dolly Parton. And all does, in one. He does these mesmerizing clothing changes. <laughs> he goes behind like a partition <laughs> and, and struggles. struggles so hard to change <laughs> costumes. Yeah. So, and with Brother Boy, so he's working. He's not in this small town. I think it's like Winters, Texas or something. But he's in another, like a slightly bigger city in Texas. And he's performing at this club. And he, like a, a drifter, walks in for a drink. And he's a bisexual man on the run from the law who's a murderer. With the fakest <laughs> drawn-on tattoos you've ever seen in your life. Yes. They look like Sharpie onto his body. <laughs> so he, like, takes Brother Boy on the run with him. <laughs> and um, I thought that was so funny. Yeah. Because, like, Brother Boy's, like, oblivious to, like, what's going on with the crime and everything. I kind of wish that they had, like, just run with that as, like, the only movie or something. Like, this movie's an hour and 46 minutes long. Uh-huh. It is so long for this kind of film. Like, it's at least a half an hour too long. You know, with the play, <laughs> okay, maybe you don't want to sacrifice any of that dialogue and, like, things people are used to right. seeing on the stage. This just feels like something that was written, like... Because people love these characters and want to hear more jokes from them. Right. Which I totally get. That's fine. And you want to know what happens to him after. Yeah, but at the same time, you got to tighten it up. There's a <laughs> lot of like, it felt like watching a TV show. Yeah. And when I was pulling clips for this episode, most of the clips I was finding were from people who love the TV show version of this. We need to like, watch the TV show. It seemed really funny. It seemed way funnier than I think this. it only lasted like a season. Because what happened was the TV show, like, I guess got canceled. And then people wanted more. So then he was like, oh, I'll make a very sordid wedding. I wish they had cut it down a little bit. Especially once they realized gay marriage is legal now. So our whole gay marriage plot is, like, not working out. I think it worked. Because, like, the town is pissed off by it. Which I think, like, when gay marriage did become legal, like, people were so, like, they're like, oh, my God, they're coming for my Christian rights and <laughs> holy shit. So it kind of played on that. I did, like, the church marquee that was, like, the Supreme Court is not the supreme being. Uh, <laughs> and they have these big equality versus the yes. Bible fights. And what is interesting is Latrell's character. Forgot to mention that shit. Yeah. So she is, she's kind of, like, turned a new leaf. She looks like she had some incredible work done. She reminds me of Jane Fonda, like Jane Fonda now. Like, she looks just like her, with whatever she did to her face. Yeah. It's amazing. So she is, like, more accepting of Ty, basically because, like, both him and his partner are expecting twins from a surrogate. So she's going to be, like, a G-ma. So I think that's kind of what's pulling her in, for the most part. Like, she doesn't seem to be like, I'm so proud of my son. Like, she's like, I'm going to be a grandmother. Right. So that's why I accept it. Which is uh, some progress from her character in the first movie. Like, obviously not enough, but some. And she does ultimately reject the church that's, like, trying to turn him into a (laughs) demon for being gay. So Sissy and Latrell are very, like, they go with, like, the Bible. And it's a lot of, like, what's generally done in conversation whenever Bible thumpers are like, here's this, like, line in the Old Testament about, like, man not like one other man. They're like... Who's eating pork? We like bacon. You're sinners too. And like, we better stone this adulterer. Like they're throwing that stuff at them. And I thought that was kind of funny because it's like, God, this is so repetitive. Like every time I have these conversations, it's the same thing that goes back and forth. And then like, it's it's not the same. Like that's like the big thing. Like it's not the same. That's what I'm talking about. Ultimately though, we all agree with one side of that argument. If you're going to watch this movie in the first place and then you, it ends on this big, passionate like tear jerking speech from uh what's her name lavon at the end about <laughs> whoopi goldberg and whoopi goldberg's there as like the pastor <laughs> at their wedding and it just is so <laughs> sincere and so like heartfelt which is not what i like about this series like right. i like the drunken gay quips and right. they're just not there it got really sappy <laughs> And, you know, if we I was... want more Brother Boy shows. <laughs> yeah. Like, Brother Boy being terrified of his therapist who's popping up in these, like, PTSD nightmares and, yes. like, whipping her titties out again. And uh, then he, like, he does, like, the, I, d- I do away with you. Like, whenever in movies <laughs> when people, like, try to, like, lose the spirit yeah. that's haunting them. That's funny. And she, like, disintegrates. <laughs> 
Right? I could have done with the whole hour and 40 something minutes if it was mostly that. There, Yeah, I would say this one was like, they had like more serious parts in it than Sorted Lives. Like another serious part I forgot about is whenever Brother Boy goes to perform in a drag show and like the queens just like tear him apart and like make him feel like shit. Tammy Wynette, more like Tammy Wynette. <laughs> I know. It was so sad. Like, it was funny. Yeah, it was funny. But it was sad because, like, it was breaking Brother Boy's heart. He was just, you know, he was just trying to, like, try something new. And they were very, like, non-inviting to him. I gotta say, most of his arc and his, like, screen time worked for me in this movie. Yeah. I, I really liked him being alone in his new apartment where he talks to a framed portrait of Tammy Wynette. He's like, Tammy, give me strength. <laughs> <laughs> My sweet Tammy. <laughs> That's so funny. I love that. I want a picture of Tammy Wynette above my bed. And I'll just like sing, I don't want to play house you, all night to her. You know what also justified this to me was uh, the Juanita content. So <laughs> Juanita is just this oblivious drunk who has no idea what's going on. <laughs> she just kind of floats around and yeah. babbles. And there's some great jokes about that. Like, I don't know if on the series, maybe they developed her more, but there's a, a line where the bartender is saying like, yeah, we've had some crazy times over the years. Remember the time we lost Juanita for two days because she got so <laughs> drunk she got lost? And Juanita's like, did you find me? <laughs> She's like really concerned. <laughs> they never found her. <laughs> That's a good joke. She did have a role in the first movie I forgot about. She drove. Um... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> she... <laughs> I'll drive. She drove drunk. Noletta and Lavanda. <laughs> Did they end up in jail because of that? Yes. Yeah, because she's fucking wasted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just feel like the first one is bloated with characters, but they're all funny and every line is funny. This yeah. one is bloated with characters and there's parts that are like trying to be emotional and, you know, politically rabble rousing for something that right. had already happened by the time yeah. it was released. It's definitely already happened by now. Uh <laughs> So, I don't know. I I liked parts of it a lot. I thought yeah. it was funny. I'm glad I watched it. I it just, was good. Like, I don't... Yeah. Re- I liked it. I'd probably watch it again. It definitely felt like watching a TV show, where the first one feels like watching a play. So, there is a website for a very sorted wedding. So, you like, you know, whenever they do, like, crowdfunded movies, they do, like, these websites saying, like, here's our story, and here's what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Well, the merchandise, they have candles for every character. So, there's, wow. like, 50 candles. <laughs> And each one has, like, a fragrance for that particular character. What's one need is, like, hairspray and cigarettes. <laughs> oh, God. Send it to me now. Just, like, stale Budweiser. <laughs> Just like my hairdresser from the bayou. Yeah. But, yeah, so, I don't know. I liked it a lot. Well, I picked something a lot less fun. <laughs> <laughs> Buzz cool. Yeah. I, which I I remember this being like kind of dark and kind of a downer, but watching it again is like, oh, wow, this is some real shit. Yeah, yeah. But I think it does pair well with the rest of this. It's a film called Boys in the Band. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's from 1970. It sounds fun. It does sound fun, yeah. <laughs> but it's not fun. And it kind of starts fun. It, it starts fun, but then it gets sad. This is a adaptation of a play from William Freakin. Freakin's filmed a lot of plays excellently. He does these great, like, confined space things. Uh, he did Bug and Killer Joe and The Birthday Party. <gasps> those are all great filmed plays. And he's also done a couple films about gay culture. Uh, and both times he did it, he was protested by gay people. <laughs> <laughs> Because he has a dark, miserable worldview in general. And, uh-huh. Uh, and to set, for this, like, straight guy to come in and set these, like, dark, miserable films in yeah. the gay world, both at times when there wasn't a lot of happy, pleasant representation of gay people. The other film is Cruisin' from the 80s, when gay people really wanted to be accepted, like, as part of the mainstream. Uh, he filmed this, like, nasty slasher film like in a leather bar scene Mm -hmm. uh and like really went for this like niche extreme example of gay culture and boys in the band comes just after stonewall and like at at the beginning of pride and he has all of these characters who hate themselves and are miserable yeah to be fair the pay the play written by matt crowley was written pre-stonewall yeah and it's before pride it's from a time when all these characters are basically stuffed into closets violently right they, they aren't allowed to be out and proud they have to kind of hide themselves among straight people which is like that's the lens that i viewed it from where i understand the criticism where it's like oh like it's 
the you know the sad gay movie like not all gays are sad and i'm like well these people are like miserable because they can't be themselves in public and they face all this scrutiny and they're like i don't know like i got that from it i think that i think it's pretty clear it, when you it's actually like watch the movie like that the self-hatred is not because they're gay it's because these people outside of them are like right. forcing them to be something they're not or right like physically beating them oh uh, like, yeah yeah and you see it very clearly in this, like, dinner party they're throwing um, for a friend, for Harold, who we will definitely get to later. Uh, <laughs> Harry! <laughs> there's, like, I, I want to say about eight characters. I, I don't know if that's so accurate. so many A of lot them. of characters. Kind of like, I mean, is this a theme? Because in Sorted Lives, we had, like, the family tree that was, like, so complex. With this friend group, I was like, now who's who? Who's, like, doing what? Who's the teacher? Now, I haven't read a lot of interviews a with lot. Del Shores, but I would b- be shocked to hear him say that he was influenced in no way <laughs> by this, like, seminal gay play, you know? Oh, totally. It just seems, yeah, it seems natural. But, yeah, basically what happens is they're throwing a birthday party for Harold, and there's all these different gay archetypes in this thing. Right. There's Michael, who's, like, the pinnacle, self-hating, mean, drunk gay. Uh, right. And then there's, like... People who are straight passing. There are people who are like very campy and like over the top, and like everyone in between on that spectrum. Yeah. And they're having a great cocktail party and having fun and tossing off jokes back and forth. Like who? Do they I... even dance together. Yeah, like synchronized dancing. Who do I have to fuck to get a drink around here? Like, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> love that part. <laughs> and while they're dancing and having this like joyous celebration. Uh, one of Michael's straight friends comes over. Ruining the damn party. And the whole balloon is just deflated. <laughs> just like when you're at a gay bar and a straight person walks in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they yell at, like, the most effeminate character, like, no camping uh, while he's here. And, like, <laughs> basically, Michael has it in his mind that his friend who's straight who's over is actually closeted and ready to leave his wife. And Michael tries to tease this revelation out of this guy and it culminates in two very violent ways. Ooh. One is that he punches the most effeminate character Emery. in the face. Yeah. And makes his lip bleed everywhere. <laughs> and then the other way is that Michael gets increasingly drunk and dark and decides to play a telephone game. Oh, God. Which is the second act of the film. Um, it gets so dark. Yeah. He pressures everyone in the room to take turns. They're all like really drunk <laughs> to take turns <laughs> what are they drinking <laughs> hard liquor like you know martinis are basically just gin with a little olive juice back That's then true i mean i'd probably play the phone game too if yeah. i had a couple of those fuck so the idea is you call the <laughs> one person in your life who you've loved and because these are people who've grown up in a time where love was not something that they were allowed socially right. or at least not allowed out in the open this prompt to call someone you love and confess who you are that you Ooh. love them Results in these very, like, self-torturous revelations. Right. And to be honest, this is one of my favorite types of movies, uh, which is probably why I love this so much, where, you know, early on you get, like, some outside external shots of New York City. You go, you go to this, like, one gay bar in Greenwich Village for a second. You yeah. see people shopping on Saks Fifth and all this shit. <laughs> and then everyone culminates in this party, and the party just gets worse and worse and worse. And, and you nobody leave. can leave. I love that shit so much. <laughs> It was very, I mean, I know I brought it up earlier when I was talking about Cold Day in the Park, but this was very, like, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Yes. Where you're you're just trapped. And I like how this was sort of the two acts where you get the fun, exciting at the beginning, where it's kind of like, I looked at that part as being like the exterior, like whenever, you know, that's how people perceive like a lot of, you know, homosexual people is like, oh, like they're always happy and jolly and sassy and they don't give a shit. And, you know, it's really sunny outside and then it starts to rain. And then not only does like the subject matter become dark, but like the lighting gets really darker and they're inside this house and like just their inner struggles just burst out and like... It's sad. Like, I mean, there were moments where I was, like, about to cry. And then it's, like, insane where I'm, like, someone's going to kill somebody. Like, it was just getting so intense. It feels very um, true to somebody, though. Like, the playwright feels like he was getting something out here. Like, this doesn't feel like 
it's exploiting gay people by making them look miserable. It no! looks like one particular gay person wrote some shit that was bugging him deep down inside. <laughs> And there's made a bunch of characters to express all of it. Oh, it's so fucked up. Right. And I, like, I understand, like I was saying before, like, I understand how it's like a damper on pride. And I get that. But I think that if there was a straight person watching this that was just kind of like, whatever, about the whole, you know, gay rights situation, they're like, whatever, I don't care. Like, when you see something like that, you're like, oh, this is really sad, like... I don't know, like, that's what movies do. Like, they're supposed to, like, change people. They're so. supposed to generate empathy in you. Right. Yeah. And if this this does the job, I think, like, if... It gives you a very specific yeah. perspective that we don't normally see on screen a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think the difference is, and honestly, it's still a problem now. There's just not enough gay representation on screen. Mm-hmm. So we don't see a lot of happy gay people. We see people who fall in love and die in some tragic way. Or, <laughs> right. Like, have these like miserable self-hatred parties i don't think that's necessarily the fault of the playwright maybe it's the fault of people who only green light plays where if you're gay you're miserable so we're not getting yeah. the full spectrum of that emotion can i watch happy gay movies for an episode yeah that, like I'm sure we could find a not few. another gay movie i've never seen that i used to own it i don't have it anymore i've heard it's fun it's good <laughs> This is uh, not another gay movie as well, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> in a really fucked I up way. Mean. I do like that um, when the party starts to tank and when it like starts to get really dark and Michael's like drunk mean Ugh. side comes out. Well, yeah, because then you find out he's like an alcoholic and he hasn't drank in like a long time. And then he starts to get back into his alcoholism. Oh, God. And when they start talking about like the people they're calling, the one of them, it's like, oh, like... It was a dentist I used to be in love with or like my mom's co-worker's son that I had this like sexual experience with that I'm still in love with. It's just like, it was so sad. It was like a lot to like take on. Yeah. Well, I like when that starts though is exactly when Harold arrives. Um, oh. <laughs> and if I had to call someone that I loved, I would call Harold. <laughs> I love this character so fucking much. He, Harold reminded me a little bit of... Do you remember that movie, Phantom of the Paradise? Oh, yeah. Great film. He kind of reminds me of Swan. Okay. Like, just this, like, mysterious, like, don't give a shit attitude. He's stoned. He <laughs> wears these giant colored sunglasses with these giant rings on his finger. He's awesome. And he goes, life's a goddamn riot. Like, he's just got this really, like, <laughs> wry <laughs> delivery. He opens up his sweater and he's like, oh... Yeah. This is great. And you can tell he's got <laughs> just as dark of a worldview as Michael. Right. But he's already gone through whatever Michael's going through. He's, like, on the other side of it. And he's very at peace with, like, all the fucked up shit happening around him. And is he's not approving of what Michael's doing, but he's kind of observing quietly and making these, like, wry jokes about it. Yeah. And I feel like he helps the movie not feel totally like misery porn. Like, it, it yeah. he keeps the mood kind of funny. Even when it's, like, so dark you want to cry and, like, jump out a window. Oh, Harry. (laughs) Yeah. There's this great scene with Harold where he's, like, yelling at somebody and he um, kind of talks about how, like, you can pretend you can do this, but you can never. Like, it's always there. Like, being homosexual is always there. You can't ignore it. Yeah. Michael wishes he was straight. Yes. And he wants to pray the gay away at church. That part. I couldn't think about it. But I remember being like, whoa, holy shit. Like, you can't. Like, yeah. You know, and I thought that was really poignant. Which is the conversion therapy stuff we see with Brother Boy. Oh, God. Yeah, and all the, like, Which Christian equality versus the still happening. Bible. It's bizarre. Like, oh, I yeah. watched, like, Boy Erased with my mom. That looked miserable. we were like, what the fuck is this? Like, who knew? Like, I mean, you hear about this kind of stuff, but, like... Not how, like, mainstream it is and how they make it look like, oh, it's just like, you know, vacation Bible school. And that one looks, it's boy, race and stuff like that. That looks like more of a traditional gay misery movie where, like, if you're gay, the world will punish you and you'll die. Right. Uh, this is a little different in that it feels like it's written by a gay person in that um, it has these, like... And it was. It was. But it has these, like quippy jokes the same way that sorted lives does yeah uh except the jokes are like cutting a little too deep they say really mean things about each other what do you think about all the racist jokes yeah there's one black character among them so hard to stomach and they say this like really it's well 
Okay, but the thing is, it starts off, like, sarcastic and campy. Right. Like, they're saying stuff that's offensive, and they they find it funny because it's offensive. And he's like, oh, fuck y'all. Yeah. Uh, but later, they do the same jokes, but the tone's just slightly but different. But purposefully To me. hurt him. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, I feel like they turn that, like, quippy, taking you to the library over cocktails, like, reading you. Mm. They're turning that into something very dark just by slightly turning the mood in the room sour. Yeah. So I just thought it was like a kind of like a darker take on the same kind of humor you see in Sorted Lives, which wasn't something I thought about when I wanted to watch these together, but watching them back to back, that sort of jumped out at me. Maybe to watch these three movies, you'd have to make like a good Sorted Lives sandwich where you have Sorted Lives, then Boys in the Band, and then a very (laughs) Sorted Wedding to end with. Yeah. You know? Well, maybe that's the uh, it gets better kind of thing. Because there's a lot yes. of feel good stuff in yeah, sorted wedding. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good one. I don't know if I could recommend a sorted wedding to people. Like, I'm gonna recommend it to everybody. <laughs> I liked it. Well, I like it because I like the characters and I liked hearing more jokes from them. I feel like if you watch Sorted Lives and I haven't even seen the TV show, but I would recommend watching the TV show first before <laughs> the movie, just from the five clips. Yeah, <laughs> on like, the internet, it seems like. If you're still wanting more from those characters, that's when you watch that movie. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't recommend the movie by itself or anything. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, a standalone I comedy. Would. I think you liked it more than I did. I did like it. Yeah. I liked it more than you for sure. Well, Sorted Lives, we both enjoyed a lot. Especially Beth Grant. Yeah. She never gets enough to do. She gets She's a lot so to do funny. in this movie. <laughs> and Leslie Jordan as well. Yes. Uh, how do you feel about Boys in the Band? Boys in the Band, I would recommend it if, like, if you're not in the mood for, like, a funny, lighthearted show. But I think it's it's such, like, a iconic movie in gay cinema where I think this is probably one of the first big, like, films. In- it's not the first, but it's one of the first one of, for yeah. sure, yeah. So I think it's important to watch, for sure. Just to at least get um, a perspective of, like, what it was like during that time period. Like, like you said, like, this was probably, like, the play was, like, pre-Stonewall. Um, just to kind of get a glimpse. There was no pride. Which yeah. Which is kind of part of the problem. Exactly. So I think it's I think it's important. I really love it. I, when we did our top five Freakins, this was very high on my list. It didn't make it to <laughs> our cut. That last name. Yeah, this movie's freaking good. Um, yes. <laughs> it's something that I wish hadn't come out at the exact moment that it did. Like, maybe if it come out a little earlier, it would be better respected. Well, but... I don't know if you heard, but Netflix is doing a redo of this That's in 2020. And they recently had a stage um, revival of yeah. it. With a bunch of famous people. Yeah, and that's what's going to be, I believe, that's what's going to be the Netflix um, version. It's going to be like Matt Bomber or Boomer. I can't print. Is he from Magic Mike? Yes. I like him, yeah. Yeah, me too. I love and the guy him. who and played Spock color. in the Star Wars movies. Zachary Quinto. Yeah. Um, who else? Just like a lot of big, like Andrew Rannells. Hmm. He was the dad in A Simple Favor. He okay. was the, one of the kids' dads. I like the, him, um, yeah. yeah. he's so funny. And he was in, I think, The Book of Mormon on Broadway, okay. too. I think that'll be kind of cool. So that's in about a year from now. So maybe we can... Yeah, we can, I, I, I'd watch <laughs> that. Revisit it. And there's a bunch of documentaries about the movie that have sort of like... Yeah. Re-examining... Or at least about the play, sort of re-examining its place in the world. Yeah, and it's interesting too because, and like, like we talked about, like this was written. It was written by a gay man. Mm-hmm. The play was written by a gay man, and freaking just basically filmed the play. And it was produced by gay men too, and a lot of the actors were gay men, right? Too, which was kind of interesting. I think that's. I that's think that's big. important, honestly. Mm-hmm. Oh, we forgot to talk about the Midnight Cowboy. Oh, the uh, <laughs> the hustler. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! <laughs> I love that. I love the poster for the film where it's like, this is Harold. It's his birthday. <laughs> this is Harold's present. Uh, and, you know, it's a shot of Harold and right next to him is his birthday present, which is like this young stud. Who doesn't even have a name. Yeah. <laughs> Total idiot. One of the best jokes is like, uh, he's like, I was uh, doing chin-ups and I fell on my heels and hurt myself. And they're like, you shouldn't do chin-ups and heels. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I like that. I wish we still had like singing telegram people. So I could think of like at least three movies. Well, so this is a movie with a singing telegram mm-hmm. cowboy. And then you've got Clue with a singing telegram girl. And then in Not of This Earth, the singing telegram oh, like <laughs> happy birthday stripper. <laughs> I saw a good movie with that recently called The Breaker Uppers on Netflix. With the telegram person? Is yeah, there's what's one of the scenes. They're like <gasps> cool. a breakup for hire business. Do uh, they still, do they make these? 
I mean, are these people still existing I today? I bet you get, like, candy grams and things like that. So I'm sure, I'm sure someone yeah. will sing to you. Okay. Well, we'll investigate. We'll come yes. back with some <laughs> sing telegram uh, information <laughs> next episode. Uh, in the meantime, we post a new movie review every day on swampflix.com. Yes. Check us out sometime. And this is a weekly show now, so we'll be back next week with another episode. Yes. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. my grip doing my chin-ups and I fell on my heels and twisted my back. You shouldn't wear heels when you do chin-ups. <laughs> <laughs>